Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Universitas 11 Maret Fintech Summer Course 2020. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased uh, to be able to welcome you to one of our international agenda, UNS Fintech Summer Course 2020. Okay, that's great. So we have future, we have technology, we have um, advanced. To get investor attraction is to get your customer attention. What you really to need to focus on is not how to get money, but how to grow your business. And professionally, their consumer is, is definitely not being seen. So here, sustainable and usually another participants students wants to give uh, the live question for you Ms. Leslie. I find that it is interesting that the involvement of central banks is it possible that the change of value in the cryptocurrencies will affect uh, the transmission or uh, the macroeconomics or any economic policy that the central banks are trying to make when they talk about so it is, has nothing to do with cryptocurrency, has nothing to do with Bitcoin, and is not for speculation. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Rektor for Universitas 11 Maret, Profesor Jamal Wiboho. Vice Rector for Planning, Partnership, Business and Information Affairs, Profesor Sagiden. Director of Partnership, Development and International Affairs, Dr. Irwan Trinugroho. Dean of Faculty of Economic and Business, Profesor Joko Suharyanto, Chairman of International Office Universitas 11 Maret. Vice Deans of Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Blaise Maret, Mr. Agung Purwoko, Deputy Director, Department of Payment System Policy, Bank Indonesia, Professor Ahmed Farouk Aysen, and Professor Mustafa Disli from the Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar Doha. To all of distinguished instructor of the second um, UNS and HBKU, the FinTech Summer Course, and last but not least, of course, all of the registered participants, welcome to the opening ceremony of the second UNS and HPKU Fintech Center uh, Fintech Summer Course 2021. So this uh, summer course is hosted and organized by the Center for Banking and uh, Fintech, Universitas Blasmarit Indonesia, in collaboration with the Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar, and also Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas Lesnar. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Dewan Di Chining Si, and it's such a big pleasure for me to be part of this significant agenda. So, uh, to ask, as an introduction, I think it will be good for us to see the video profile of the Center for Banking and FinTech, Universitas Lesnar. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's take a look.
Welcome to the Center for Fintech and Banking, Universitas 11 Maret. Established in 2020, the Center for Fintech and Banking, UNS Fintech Center, is one of the Center of Excellences in Universitas 11 Maret. To be the Center for Training and Education, Capacity of Building in Financial Technology and Banking, Center for Research in Financial Technology and Banking and to be an innovation hub for technological-based financial innovation. UNS Fintech Center is supported by reputable researchers in financial technology and banking with extensive experiences in education, research, scientific publication, and community engagement becoming the core excellence in our programs. Due to the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, all of our events are conducted virtually through Zoom Cloud meetings or YouTube live streaming. In 2020 alone, UNS Fintech Center has successfully organized many events such as International Seminar Fintech and the Future of Finance, International Webinar Global Economy and Financial Sector Post-COVID-19, International Webinar Financial Crime, Fraud and Cyber Security, Online Workshop on Publishing Research Papers in Finance Journals, Online Workshop Recent Topics for Research in Finance, World Class Professor Program, UNS Fintech Center also organized the first virtual summer course program in financial technology and banking on 10 up to 14 August 2020. Inviting 16 instructors from 14 institutions with total 518 participants from 40 countries. Nurturing the creative digital business environment, UNS Fintech Center held a competition in digital innovation. All these achievements are supported by our partners. Supporting high-quality research in finance and banking. UNS Fintech Center provides a free access to the ACON data stream for the UNS academic members. This access is part of the research grants program under the Erasmus Plus Capacity Building in Higher Education Project. Optimizing research and doctoral programs in banking and finance in Indonesian universities. To be a well-established center for excellence, UNS Fintech Center will return with a greater global competition in digital innovation, the IC 2021, and establish further partnership and collaboration with external institutions. UIPT Center for Fintech and Banking UNS educate, innovate, collaborate and disseminate. Ladies and gentlemen, so that was the uh, profile for the Center for Banking and Fintech, Universitas Blaise Manet. And as we can see from the profile that we see that as the Center for the Excellence, uh, Center for Bank Banking and Fintech Universitas Blaise Marriott are highly uh, is highly committed to deliver a good fintech summer course. Of course, by engaging a very professional of the instructor from academic and also from the professional also. And of course, uh, I would like to uh, proudly announce that last year we invite and have more than five hundred participants for more than ten countries. And this year also we would like to welcome more than 400 registered participants from 23 countries. So it's, it was, will be a very good pleasure for us to having all of the participants. And we, we hope that uh, this summer course will give you the insightful knowledge and to be formally open this index summer course, I would like to invite and humbly invite the rector for Universitas Blaise Marat, Professor Jamal Wiwoho, to deliver their remarks. So, Prof. Jamal. Thank you. Platform. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am pleased to welcome to the second 
UNS HBQU Fintech Summer Course 2021, collaboration between the Center for Fintech and Banking and the Faculty of Economic and Business, Universitas 11 Maret. We are also happy that the summer course is also collaboratively organized with the support from Ahmad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, I would like to extend my gratitude to God because the blessing we can the creator in this event, even though still in the pandemic situation. Secondly, I am honored to welcome all 15 invite instructor who will share their knowledge and insight to all fine tech summer school students. They are coming from academic, practitioner, fintech specialist, and regulator. Let me give me my warm welcome to Professor David Lee, the president of Global Fintech Institute, Mr. Iman Shah, Deputy Commissioner of Indonesia Financial Services Authority, OJK, Mr. Agung Purwoko, Deputy Director of Bank Indonesia, Mr. Sunu Widyat Moko, General Secretary of the Indonesia Joint Fintech Association, Mr. Paul Skold, Founder and Editor of Solta Research, Mr. Diki Wijaya, Chief Information Officer, Investry, Professor Ahmed Farouk Aisan from Hamid Ben Khalifa University, Qatar, Professor Alistair Melna from Longburg University, United Kingdom, Professor John Kudel from University of Akron, United States of America, Dr. Mustafa Disley from Ahmad bin Khalifa University, Qatar, Dr. Ruth Taknek from University of Limoges, French, Dr. Silvana Maya Damayanti from Institute Teknologi Bandung, Mr. Darmadi Gusanto from Alpha GVC Venture, Ms. Clarissa Alvira Gunawan from Alpha GVC Center, and Dr. Putra Pamungkas from Universitas 11 Maret, Surakarta. 432 students from 23 countries is registered in the summer course. Therefore, I also want to say hi to all students coming from Algeria, Argentina, Azerbaijan, Bahamas, Bangladesh, Ivory Coast, France, German, Indonesia, Malaysia, Nigeria, Oman, Pakistan, Palestine, Philippines, Qatar, Arab Saudi, South Africa, Timor Leste, Turkey, Uganda, United Kingdom, and United States of America. UNS HBQU Fintech Summer Course 2021 is organized as response to the development of technology and digitalization in the financial industry. This summer course is one of platform for local and international students to equip themselves with the understanding of fintech and banking digital finance. There are 14 models to be discussed during five days summer course with the is equipment with two credit. To all invited instructor, you willing 
to share your knowledge to all students is really appreciated. I would you can visit Universitas 11 Maret and Solo, Indonesia, somebody. Finally, I would like to say thank to the Center for Fintech and Banking Universitas 11 Maret, the Faculty of Economic and Business of UNS and the Hamad bin Khalifa University, Qatar. Thank you for all effort you put to make this event possible. Including, let me reiterate that I strongly expect that this FinTech Summer course will be beneficial to all of us. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much for Prof. Jamal for the remarks. And um, I do very agree that this uh, Center for the Excellence, um, Center for FinTech and Banking University of Smart is one of the uh, center that highly committed to give you a comprehensive uh, FinTech and digital economics um, courses to all of the students from all over the world. So this year we have 23 uh, countries participated in um, and for more than 400 participants registered for this program and it won't be happening if we have we don't have a very good collaboration and this year we collaborate with external collaborator from the uh, Hamad bin Khalifa University and I would like to invite Professor Ahmed Farouk Aysen the representative from the Hamad bin Khalifa University to providing another remark so Prof. Eisen, do you hear me? Yes, I I do hear you. Do you hear me? Yeah, it's very good morning, Prof. Very very good morning to you all. Uh, good to be here. Uh, so, thank you, please, thank Prof. you for the uh, kind invitation. Also, first, uh, uh, His Excellency Rector uh, Prof. Jamal Buahu, thank you very much for this kind introduction and kind speech. Uh, it is always good to be part of uh, this organizations, and I have been following UNS uh, for uh, for uh, more than six years now. Uh, one of my first encounter was in France in Limoges when there was a signing agreement for the Erasmus Plus uh, between UNS and the University of Limoges with Professor Amin Tarazi. So since then, uh, mashallah, I am seeing big improvement uh, and. Uh, also, overall, as a country, Indonesia ha has been doing great. I am at the advisory board of the uh, Journal of uh, Bank Indonesia, and I have the chance to follow uh, most recent developments. And mashallah, Indonesia is one of the rising countries uh, among the emerging market countries. And definitely, this is reflected at, in the universities, and UNS is one of them. Mashallah, in the rankings, uh, in the reputation, UNS is rising. So at Hamad bin Halifa University, uh, we are also uh, trying to follow the same path. Uh, we are rising in uh, ranking and our reputation is even increasing. And one of the reasons is to invest in fintech. Uh, fintech is changing all the landscape and uh, the banking finance will not be the same anymore. And especially countries like with large population like Indonesia, and also countries with small population are allowed to benefit from FinTech because the larger countries have the potential anyway by the size of the country, by the population of the country. Uh, so they can uh, reap the benefits of uh, scale. And for smaller countries like Qatar, uh, they have the chance to invest in technology in ways of doing business and to collaborate with the larger countries like Indonesia and to expand into other countries uh, because uh, the scale is quite important in fintech, uh, most of the fintech applications. Uh, but you know, uh, what is even more important to be able to foresee this, and that is uh, what I like about the summer school because this is the second fintech summer school, and we are part of the second one, not the first one. So I am very happy to see uh, UNS has uh, take the lead, and uh, thank you for making us part of it. Uh, in Qatar, at Hamad bin Halifa University, we are all, also investing in fintech. 
we have fintech working group we are having uh, seminars uh, in fintech many of the things are still in making uh, we are learning a lot from the practice even during the covid 19 there are lots of innovations new companies new success stories came out uh, so uh, we are all students of uh, fintech in a sense so we have more than 400 participants today coming from 23 countries but i believe we will all learn together because it is not something like a very established field it is still uh, ongoing with the payment systems uh, with online banking neo banking with cryptocurrencies bitcoin many many of the uh, advances in finance is actually taking place because of the financial technologies uh, so i hope uh, uns and hpqu will continue this collaboration for the upcoming years because i believe this could be a very good tradition uh, in the uh, context of uh, fintech and this is the future there are very good developments for example professor david lee is uh, uh, with us he's going to be presenting in one of the sessions uh, they have a, a fintech center in singapore and they are doing very good things and uh, they are even giving some certifications i'm sure uh, especially for younger generations for our younger participants it is the good place to invest and inshallah uh, if we have any uh, contribution uh, in their success in this uh, ongoing uh, progress of fintech uh, we will be more than happy again i would like to thank uh, for uh, university of sabalas marat and i would like to thank the rector i would like to thank dr irwan and his team uh, at the fintech center because mashallah they are always easy going uh, they are always very quick uh, very adjustable uh, they have done most of the work i would like to thank them uh, and again i would like to thank all the speakers participants uh, very distinguished speakers we have mashallah uh, and i hope we will continue this tradition hopefully at some point in qatar in the upcoming years inshallah thank you very much again uh, to all of you and i wish you the best inshallah assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Thank you very much, Prof. Aysen, and thank you very much for the compliment also for the, the center and the UNS and for all the collaboration also. And I think, as you mentioned, that as you found that the, the center for the fintech and banking on the smart, it's fulfilling by a very agile person. And also, I think it's... Dan mohon maaf, saya kebetulan. Okay. And I, I think also the spirit for the center for fintech and banking is also in line with the uh, the spirit of the fintech itself. So we need to be agile and we need to be very adjustable. And ladies and gentlemen, uh, this thing is uh, invited uh, VIP and also all of the participants. I think we are about the end of the opening ceremony of today's agenda. And for the um, to the commentation our uh, to the commented our even today, I would like to uh, invite all of you to stay in the platform and open your camera on because we will have the photo station with all of the participants and all of the uh, attendees today. So the committee, are you ready? So uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to remind you to open your camera on. In count of three, we will have the photo station. So one, two, three. Once more, one, two, and three. Thank you very much, Prof. Jamal and Prof. Dr. Aysan, and also all of the distinguished uh, instructors that I cannot be mentioned one by one, and also, of course, all of the participants. That was the end of our opening ceremony today. So we, I hope we can enjoy, particularly for all the participants, you can enjoy and have the benefit for the uh, joining uh, in like summer course these years. And without the further ado, let's proceed to the first class for today. So I would pass to my partner, Ferry. Ferry, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I, I can hear you. So very good morning, Ferry. So ladies and gentlemen, so this uh, first uh, session we'll be talking about the payment system, right, Ferry? Yes, right. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as the moderator for today's opening agenda, I'm Saino. Thank you very much and enjoy the session with the ferry. So, ferry, platform is yours. Okay, thank you, Rivandi. 
Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants. Welcome to the first day of the second UNS SBKU FinTech Summer Course, hosted by Center for FinTech and Banking UNS in collaboration with Hamad bin Khalifa University and Faculty of Economics and Business Universitas Sebelas Maret. Today, we will have three modules that will be present, and for this module, we will discuss about digital payment that will be presented by Mr. Agung Purwoko. Mr. Agung Purwoko is Deputy Director Department of Payment System Police, Bank Indonesia. His specialties are on payment system police, microprudential police, uh, fintech, digital financial service, household economics, monetary economics, and honey market development. Hello, Mr. Agung, can you hear me? Hello, good morning, uh, Ferry. How are yeah. you today? Yeah, good morning. How are you, Mr. Agung? Fine. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining with us. Uh, from the, uh, for this session. Okay, before we start this session, please pay attention to these several rules. Number one is please turn on your camera and rename your Zoom username into your student ID uh, underscore your name. It will help us to recognize us as well. The Q&A session will be open after the material delivered by instructor and you are allowed to submit your question through Zoom chat box, or simply you can raise your hand. Uh, so I will help you to get the access for mission for live Q&A. The attendance list will be open after I request all participants to fill it. Use your student ID uh, and name to fill the attendance list. And number three is please respect the other student, instructor, or the committee members during this session. And number four is you can refer to the booklet that we already sent through the email before uh, the detailed information. Without further uh, ado, to Mr. Angung Purwoko, the time is yours. Thank you, uh, Ferry. Uh, thank you, Ferry, uh, and all the participants. Hello, Mr. Ahmed. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you for uh, inviting us uh, when us invite us again in this uh, session uh, today uh, as as a fintech uh, how fintechs work uh, you usually uh, use in collapse mode uh, in today presentation i also invite my colleague uh, to co uh, collaboration with me to share the materials regarding the transformation in digital payment system I also invite my my colleague uh, Abdurrahman to today's session, and uh, please Abdurrahman uh, uh, share our materials here, and and in today until uh, eleven forty, I will share of uh, three parts of this presentation. First, I will uh, talk about the the digital economy in finance, what is current development, what's a global. A global development in this issue uh, how business uh, our definition of the how business uh, development uh, the development of business and actors uh, and model business model and also and how uh, regulators how we regulators deal with this issue and the second part and third part uh, my colleague abdurrahman will share uh, the development if in in digital uh, in indonesia digital economic update and also uh, the role of central bank, the role of Bank Indonesia in this issue. Uh, next, Pabedur, and this is the uh, this is the, our career journey in Bank Indonesia. I also invite Pabedur to tell about her him uh, about him, and uh, I actually joined in Bank Indonesia since 20, 2005 as a regional economist and regional economist. <clears throat> Uh, I started my career in 2005. Uh, in 2011, I received an assignment as a financial market analyst. And uh, actually, my uh, precious moment when I'm uh, a company deputy governor since 12, 13, and uh, three years. And my roles, uh, my roles uh, in my assignment in fintech area begin when I was. Uh, assigned as financial stability economist, uh, I was asked to explore the various business models in fintech, and also uh, there is and how we regulators uh, try to deal with this issue. 
and uh, I'm currently now uh, as a deputy director in head of payment system policy division and uh, and also as well as a project manager in uh, blueprint for Indonesian payment system 2025. Uh, please, Pabedor, uh, introduce yourself. Thank you, Pak Agung. Um, yeah, um, just sort about me. Um, I, I started my career in 2014 as a junior financial analyst in the financial department in Bank Indonesia. Uh, later on, I could continue to pursue my uh, study as uh, in Tilburg University in Master of Science in uh, Finance. But my thesis talking specifically about how um, fintech and how fintech and bank um, collaboration is indeed um, um, you know productive um, to the industry. And therefore, because I um, write my thesis about it, uh, I um, assigned as a, a program management office for, for Indonesian payment system blueprint as a subordinate for Pagu. And yeah, as Pagu said before, that uh, our job is basically um, a lot of um, a lot analyzing or or, or, or um, doing an assessment on digital economy and finance. Maybe that's uh, for me. Thank you. Continue to you, Pak Agung. Okay, thank you, uh, Pak Bedur. Uh, let's uh, move to the next slides. Uh, here today, uh, maybe in one hour, uh, next one hour, we will talk about uh, three three issues: digital economy and finance. Indonesian digital economics update and the role of central bank in digital era. And after that 30 minutes, we can uh, discuss about the, the issue on these areas. Uh, next, uh, let's move to first part. And I, I will begin uh, the first part of this lecture by revisiting the essence of uh, digital economy. Uh, studying digital economy since 2017, uh, I often get uh, three questions. Uh, is the digital economy it's just about technology? Uh, is the computer the main actor? Uh, and is the main actor on uh, will the role of human disappear uh, if we adopt the digital economy? I then searched the four literature uh, on the digital economy and then I found the book called The Digital Economy written by Don Tapscott. This book was published in 1995. Uh, for me, actually, it was historic year because those years were my first year when I was student, as you maybe have fun uh, being student. Also, my first year learning about Microsoft Word and Microsoft Excel at that time. And uh, there are actually three interesting things about this book. And I, I, I suggest you explore more about this book. And, First, the internet was with its open market changed the nature of firm, as uh, Ronald Kuas uh, uh, mentioned. Uh, the business active access sector of company, including the formation of transaction costs. In simple words, business model transformation and industry formation. And now it's happening. The digital economy is changing how uh, companies do their business and a synergy and collaboration is the uh, keywords uh, and they're also getting faster and there are also the changing in pricing strategy. This is the first one. And the second one is ecosystem and leadership. Uh, at the beginning, there was no taxonomy and the language uh, of how digital revolution occurred, but then it develops into, into collection of uh, individuals, a collection of teams in, in organization, and extends to companies and to form an ecosystem. Uh, actually, now I'm a living witness uh, in area of payment system, how digital payment ecosystem based on QR code and now uh, open API ecosystem is growing. And leadership is also the key to expanding uh, the issue on the ecosystem. And it was not only uh, comes from regulator, actually. Uh, sometimes uh, comes from the market, the industry, and also from customer. And it's just like what this book, which released in 1995, uh, talked about it. And number three, the dark side and call for action. The dark side and call on is maybe like a Star Wars. <laughs> uh, this book also discussed about side effect, uh, the digi uh, side effect of digitalization 
uh, there are privacy issues, privacy issues and centralization of business uh, and uh, including the freedom, the freedom. Digital economy requires yesterday manager to become tomorrow's uh, leaders. And as we enter the new age, uh, the future won't just happen. It will be created. And, and if we all get involved, our values, aspiration, and growing expectation will shape and drive the transformation. So what is the conclusion, uh, actually, according to the three uh, questions? First one, digital economy is not just uh, about technology. It's also problems and a business model for solution. And number two, uh, the computer it, uh, it's just a calculating tool. So don't worry if you are not expert in computer. Uh, they still need the human who direct as a leader, as me. I'm not actually an IT, IT expert, actually. And maybe uh, Badur is also is not an IT expert. Uh, we are actually a finance person who jump in this industry and, uh, and uh, analyze and uh, uh, contribute in our expertise in, in improve uh, the society. And number three, the role of humans remains, but change, change. The important things is to notice how to overcome the dark side. Uh, let's move to the next slide, uh, Mas Pedun. And uh, this is actually the book uh, released in uh, 2020. And it's also talk about, uh, uh, and the, the essence of digital economy is still uh, much uh, a lot of debate about the definition and characteristic of digital economy. Uh, this is not only happening in the academic world as the, in the book uh, discussed, but also in practical areas, in, in our areas actually, uh, including the policy formulation. Uh, therefore, on this occasion, I hope all the participants uh, will review the literature, uh, read a lot of books in digital economy and digital finance, and uh, compare with existing practices. Uh, here, try here I try uh, to cite uh, two definition: uh, one from IMF and uh, yeah, international institution, uh, which usually make consensus uh, about among uh, all our central bankers come to EMF, uh, make a consensus on the definition. And, and according to Tim Jordan, uh, who published his book, Digital Economy in 2020. And according to EMF, digital economy is sometimes narrow, defined narrowly of, as online platform uh, and activities that owe their existence to such platform yet. Uh, in the broad sense, all activities that use digitized data a part of digital economy in modern economies, the entire economies. And uh, let's compare with uh, Jordan, with Jordan, that the digital economy is not uh, a concern primarily with selling product. Uh, so let's talk about this. So uh, digital economy is not only selling product, uh, but relies instead on creating economies, a network, a net network, and that can be read by software and algorithms. So this is uh, actually uh, the, the, the characteristic and digital economy. And let's move to the next slide. I will, I will uh, the, the comparison is, is getting real that uh, the present of digital economy is to encourage, encourage the efficiency of economic activities because of the supply chain order is increasingly streamlined while at the same time leading to consumer centricity. Let us compare uh, on the up, upside is the conventional economy and the downside is the digital economy. And uh, things are different in digital economy. Uh, the market is replaced in conventional economy. First, uh, let's uh, uh, talk about the conventional economy. In conventional economy, consumer must come to the market to fulfill their needs. As, as you said, that the customer, and maybe you, you, you should go to the mall. Okay? You should go to the market to, to buy your product. Uh, so the supply chain order is, uh, so uh, on, the, the, on the production side, there are also several level range uh, on wholesalers, manufacturers to retailers. 
And now let's go to uh, the compare with uh, digital economy. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Uh, the market is replaced with the e-commerce platform, e-commerce platform which can contain wholesalers and retailers. So uh, wholesale and retailer is now part of the platform, no platform. And meanwhile, customer, consumers no longer need to go to the market. Uh, you can uh, maybe you can also buy your your uh, stuff uh, with uh, in 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 this lecture maybe. <laughs> Maybe your father told me, oh, I forgot to pay bills, uh, pay your bills. So maybe you, you can now, now you can use it. So a consumer no longer need to go to the market. New business model has emerged, namely a delivery service that deliver good to the last miles. And what we, what we can learn from here, the form of the market has changed to platform. And number two, the new business model and players have emerged. And uh, there are bundling activities and unbundling activities. And number three, uh, finally, uh, prioritizing the uh, consumer centric. So this is the, the, the part of that. And let's move to, to the, the technology. So what the behind the technology behind it? Uh, how how the, the economy can transform to digital economy? Okay, uh, although there are elements of people and business models in, in that, in that uh, ecosystem. But uh, the technology is actually the main factor uh, in the development of digitalization. So for simplicity, for simplicity, uh, we divide into four major groups here. Uh, you can see uh, four major groups uh, corresponding to the order in typical end-to-end -end data analysis process. The first input. Uh, innovative technologies which improve the way in which data is inputted into information system. So in the payment system area, uh, uh, the most prominent innovation is QR code. Maybe you, you, you also may be familiar with QR code. QR code. Uh, in China, actually, uh, the, the breakthrough is uh, happened in China uh, in the use of QR codes, a game changer for retail payment. Uh, was pioneered by Alipay and WeChat Pay. Now in Indonesia, QI is also a game changer. Uh, and now uh, we, Bank Indonesia, standardized the QR codes uh, in the name of QR code Indonesian standard, Chris. And maybe uh, Pabedur will explore more uh, regarding this issue on the, the third side. And the second one is storage. The storage, innovative technology which improves the way in which data is uh, stored. In the past, information system data was stored in a server um, and only owned by maybe one entity. Uh, now storage can be done together, together uh, served by maybe one company, cloud computing company, and uh, through cloud computing. Its function, sometimes its function not only store, but also uh, uh, several analytic uh, function. Herein, known as data as a service. It's part of maybe uh, there are uh, cloud computing, quantum, safe cryptography, and other uh, innovation in part of storage. And third part is transfer. This is how innovative technology, which improves the way uh, data is transferred from first uh, computer to, to the next computer, from one information to another information system. Uh, and uh, now, uh, maybe uh, the the term of API, application programming interface, is now uh, increasingly popularly used in payment system areas. API are programming interface that connect platform or program, uh, making requests uh, and communicating uh, data between them. Uh, they outline set of rules, routine that establish protocols through which this platform are interact and and we talk and when we talk about apis there are uh, uh, two point of view companies that promote open innovation uh, such as google which provide plugins such as google maps for use on any website or platform and number two companies that want uh, 
to reduce time to launch new solution uh, on the market, taking advantage of ready-made codes. So uh, maybe, for example, if you can imagine, that's how uh, Google Maps. Google Maps actually a great example of an API. Uh, though through its original code, countless other site and application use map data to embed the component on their own solution. So uh, maybe you if you use Gojek, it's also use Google Maps. If you use Uber, they 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 are they are also use Google Maps and other application. And and then and fourth part is analytics analysis. Uh, this is the 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 innovation in part how the data now is become <coughs> become used for analytic dlt uh, like the big data analytics here and in the past data could not be analyzed if it not uh, it was not organized beforehand and therefore, there is science of statistics. And now, even unstructured data now can be optimized using big data technology. So, big data is combination of structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, and it can be mined for information and used in machine learning, predictive modeling, and other advanced analytics. So, it's all part of the global trend in exploring innovative technology. Now, next to move to uh, next slides. This is the how payment evolution continues. Payment trends as as the technology move uh, change. Uh, payment trend also constantly evolving uh, from barter technological development encourage the evolution of payment to become easier, faster, more efficient, and now borderless. Payments have evolved from barter to coins, banknotes electronic transfer plastic now you can use plastic uh, card and digitization in the form of cryptocurrencies stable coins and now digital currencies this innovation provide various positive impact in current transaction growth even though now we are in a covid 19 pandemic but on the other hand as i told before there are dark side dark side of digitalization and also a uh, threat of disruption in the form of monetization of digital assets, such as crypto stable coin and use of phone credit as currency, including their use in illegal activities and criminal acts. So this is how we regulators deal with that issues. Uh, next on the next slide. Uh, so here is the the slides describe an area of innovation and the payment ecosystem and how we regulators deal uh, regulator direction on the left we see the various innovation in the payment area digitization of paper based processing uh, maybe uh, ITM ATM is an example ATM digitization of paper based processing the second one is the use of mobile technology now you can pay uh, not only by your card or uh, money but also use your uh, mobile phones it can connect it to your electronic uh, wallet electronic wallet or e-money or uh, your bank account is and uh, so if you can access uh, your account uh, you we must ensure that it must access by authorized person so therefore digital id verification is a must is needed uh, now is now also growing uh, so developed from pin maybe you know using you enter your pin number four number six number and now uh, now you if you forget your pin maybe you can use your uh, biometric uh, your hand maybe are now getting to your face. This is part of the, the innovation in digital ID. And also digital payment also require uh, the processing speed. You can pay instantly, instantaneously between banks uh, because there is a fast computer, fast computer uh, that does the, that do the processing. 
Number four, in making transaction, sometimes you need help. Oh, uh, you need help or assistance from the bank person. And now, uh, many banks use chatbots. Chatbots. And it's part of customer service automation here. And API, as we discussed earlier, payment data is now also widely used as credit scoring inputs. And, and, and on the regulatory trends also moving, both triggered by, uh, by demand and unsupply. On the, on the right side, you can see that uh, if we divide into four quadrant, uh, the, the regulatory trend in payment area now mostly a proactive quadrant on the supply side as well as ready on the demand side. Uh, some example in this quadrant are PSD2, Payment Service Directive through in, in Europe, Euro area, and also uh, open banking in UK, and uh, which to encourage bank and fintech interlink to be uh, in, in customer centric. In addition, there are initiatives to reduce currency and encourage non-cash payments. Infrastructure is also provided by regulators uh, and industry to make uh, affordable transaction. And on the other hand, there are also regulations that are reactive, reactive by uh, regulators after seeing the development, after seeing development on the industry, that is too fast, too slow, or not in line with direction of regulators. An example is regulation of interchange fee in some countries, in many countries that uh, perceive that uh, considered is too high, uh, regulators uh, intervene with uh, regulation on a capping uh, interchange fee. And on or tightening peer-to-peer -peer lending rules in China, imposing AML CFT rules as well as the uh, regulatory and supervisory framework for uh, fintech. Let's move to other uh, to next slides and and now we move to the digital transformation of banking. So uh, the technology advance have raised many fintech companies that began uh, to disrupt banking services. At least six key technologies used in digital banking, API, as I mentioned before, uh, have potential to deliver new and more tailored products and services to customers. Uh, cloud computing, as I mentioned before, also institution that it are investing significantly in cloud-based solution, which enable automated services to be provided uh, to a broader range and number of customers. Now, uh, most new fintech solutions are born on cloud. So, so digital banking now born on cloud. Uh, uh, and cloud-based technology are becoming essential to integrating uh, with other application. Microservices also. Microservices are a software architecture wherein application are created as individual program. This enables them to be used in a modular way by different product and service line in firm. In example, for executing one function at time instead of being integrated in single technical infrastructure. AI, machine learning, and big data, it also and biometric and blockchain, the effectiveness of blockchain technology. And uh, on the right side, we see the comparative tables. Maybe you can uh, explore more. Uh, after read these materials, and we see uh, that each party actually has advantages and disadvantages according to the characteristic of its customer. So uh, it's not always that fintech better than banks, and it's not always the banks is superior than fintech. It depends on the which consumer your your customer target, and also with the circumstances. So that's why, uh, as uh, regulators now, we try to make an interlink between bank and fintech. How to how to support a bank to transform its operation and also fintech to improve uh, their business model, especially in security. Next, uh, we move to next slides. Uh, now. 
it took years. <laughs> so the, the the slides actually is uh, is a very good uh, uh, examples for the vision. Uh, the, as the, we, it actually, it's the same with the book uh, uh, Digital Economy 1995. Uh, it, uh, Mr. Bill Gates said in 1994, a year before Digital Economy book is published. Uh, banking is necessary, but banks are not. Uh, this statement was hard to understand actually in 1994, since when fintech uh, was not popular at that time. Uh, however, uh, Actually, it's difficult to imagine a world without banks. They have been integrated into our day lives. Our everyday, our everyday lives and business could stop without bank. That's how 24-7 uh, banks should uh, serve. Uh, but now it turns out that banking is not always provided by banks. Uh, and consumer now maybe you all sometimes don't care who actually provide the banking services now. Uh, like Amazon, maybe it's a sample like Amazon, uh, which we used to know as a bookseller transformed to e-commerce. Until now, it also provides service, uh, banking service as a payment, credit, insurance, and credit card. Uh, of course, collaboration, collapse with uh, financial institution. In Indonesia, we know also uh, know Gojek, which also provide transportation services. Now they also uh, operate in the financial services uh, through GoPay, insurance with insurance companies, collaboration with insurance company, micro micro credit, and now just form a digital bank called Bank Jago. It's actually, this is the, how the development of the, the transformation from the e-commerce platform to financial service. And now sometimes consumers don't care uh, who actually served uh, the banking product. Next. So interesting, uh, interesting things in the fintech area then lead to debate what the definition of fintech. The definition of fintech. So... Uh, is fintech an institution like bank? Uh, can a bank that use technology in activities uh, can be called a fintech? Uh, for regulator, discussion on definition become very uh, crucial, critical, uh, where the definition will determine regulatory boundaries and regulatory object. Uh, don't let the error in definition make innovation hampered or inefficiency in law enforcement. For this need, uh, we we group the definition uh, become three. Uh, fintech, fintech is actually uh, a technology supported innovation in financial services. So fintech is not players. Fintech is innovation, including uh, in generating new business model application and process and product. So that's why therefore in Bank Indonesia we we not we are not we did uh, not using the term fintech as a player in various uh, regulations that we issued. We prefer use payment system provider which consists bank and non-bank which serve in area of payment services whether they using technology or not. And also and the second part is big tech group big tech uh, big tech, maybe you, if you search on the, on the uh, Google's, now it's getting familiar too. Uh, big tech is group of large technology company. Basically, it's large technology company with an extensive customer network. Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Alibaba is, is one of the examples of big tech. And the third one is third-party provider. Third-party provider is the company, this is company, uh, that provide services in cloud, security, network, API, and sometimes accounting too, uh, to both big tech or bank and fintech. Internationalization also provided guidelines on risk associated with third party, third party service provider. So uh, this is actually uh, the differences between this definition. So uh, don't confuse with the, with the term. 
And next, uh, and uh, let's move to the to that issue. Uh, so payments, uh, payment system is now uh, becoming the next big thing for big tech. The entry of last technology firm into financial survey, as I mentioned before, hold the promise efficiency gains and can hence, hence financial inclusion. But if if we look we look at the left table here, uh, it can be seen that all big tech enters the payment area, both in uh, emerging and advanced economies. Why? Because payment is important element in the in the e-commerce they run. Banks are sometimes banks sometimes less responsive to to solve this issue. Uh, furthermore, uh, payment also transaction data extraction machine. Payment is a machine uh, that can be another source of innovation, innovation and also source of revenue, uh, both in terms of e-commerce itself and other financial service. After having payment service. Some big tech further expands services to uh, credit, uh, give credit market, enter to credit market, and also to money market. So, and in the graph on the right shows that big tech is leveraging mobile payment technology for acceleration. Countries with uh, limited financial inclusion uh, indicate by low bank account as areas for big entry, big tech entry. Big tech entry present new and complex trade off between financial stability, competition, and data protection. Now, uh, let's move to the next slides. Uh, this is actually the real. Uh, this is our op ed article in uh, one of the one of uh, newspaper. Uh, when when the issue is become uh, when China has a span ad group. Uh, which had been set to become world largest IPO. Uh, one day after regulator had grilled Jack Ma, who found the company. That case was never happened actually on the IPO suspend at this stage. It never happens. But in China, it happened. Uh, there is a lot of speculation actually uh, over the suspension. But from our point of view, uh, there are at least three things. The first one, uh, business boundaries and regulatory range are becoming increasingly blurred, really blurred here. At the beginning, China's regulator was welcome. But when it expands, it required recalculation because even though the form was different, the risk that emerged from financial activities carried out by Android were actually the same as bank. So, the same risk should be the same regulation. And uh, uh, maybe uh, PBOC, the Central Bank of China, the reg government of China, uh, see that's the increasing risk regarding the uh, N group operation and goes to IPO. The second one is source of systemic risk shift. The separation actually. The separation of financial sector followed by strict regulation and supervision. Uh, it is the essence with separation of risk. But if now there are boundaries, uh, of course, uh, there is increasing risk in, on, on that issue. And so regulators should uh, focus, should uh, shift also, also shift the the attention not only not only in financial sector but also in 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 e-commerce on digital economy so uh, this is the issue number three uh, new and integrated way of surveillance so regulators need new way of surveillance not only based on reporting uh, we we as central bank or a financial supervisory usually uh, do our job do our job in supervision based on reporting and inspection but now we should move to uh, another uh, 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 by technology side like regulatory technology and supervisory technology the next this also this also the the growing trend digital asset for digital economy uh, actually digital asset is uh, are nothing new. Uh, many assets 
are already represented electronically in the form of data strings stored inside the company ledgers. Uh, however, this electronic record tend to be static, limited to narrow confines of proprietary international system. And now, uh, digital asset actually uh, move to more dynamic, more dynamic. And maybe we can focus on the crypto asset system, ecosystem. Uh, the crypto assets made 2,000 of crypto asset, and each of crypto asset has its own local ecosystem. Uh, for instance, uh, maybe in this uh, slides there are all, there are two Bitcoin and Ethereum, the two main crypto asset that each have respective uh, actors, so-called miner, that contributing to the system or developing application on top of system. Intermediary exists to connect this different local ecosystem. Now, most user and consumer lie outside the crypto asset ecosystem. Uh, therefore, this user need intermediaries. How to, call, how to enter the ecosystem? So this intermediary uh, usually a payment system provider that connect a traditional market with crypto asset ecosystem and let user convert via currency uh, and vice versa. These are referred to uh, as a fiat gateways. And uh, next, we, it's important to understand that uh, that user can make pseudonymous transfer. And fund can also move between local crypto asset through crypto asset gateways. So, uh, so the issue is how we should care with the payment system provider who deal who, uh, which part of this ecosystem we nah. and the and the development is we, we should care is stable coin actually stable coin uh, are digital tokens that aim to maintain stable value and to solve uh, the origin stories generally trace back to crypto world. Most form of crypto asset like Bitcoin are too volatile. That's why uh, some some people said Bitcoin is the future of payments in digital era. But if we set back to the definition of money, it's it would not shoot to the function of money because the money should be stable. Bitcoin are too volatile to be attractive as a sweatpad means of payment. Now, uh, to, solve, to solve this, stablecoin have turned, uh, often promise to ensure the value remains one at one. Uh, stablecoin therefore could potentially serve as a substitute for commercial bank deposit. And now move to the next slide. Central bank digital currencies. Now it comes to digital uh, central bank digital currencies that now become one of most of the central bank. Main central bank are hard to Conducting large scale pilot, so called electronic yuan. In the United States, the Federal Reserve System is doing extensive research on CBDC. And uh, so, what actually is CBDC? CBDC is digital payment instrument, denominated which is direct liability to transfer tech language. So, basically, it's the same with the money that now is used. Uh, as you know, today, commercial is public and private. Okay. Mr. Agung, I'm sorry, your voice is not clear. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, now it's clear. Not very. Uh, it is okay. still not clear. Can you turn off? Yes, yeah. yeah. and then turn on. Now. Okay, maybe I can I can stop my video. Maybe, maybe. 
I hope uh, yes, yeah. voice is getting better now. Yes, it's, it's, it's better now. Okay, thank you. Uh, CBDC actually are import opportunity for central banks to offer a technology advanced representation of central bank money for digital economy. So the crucial novelty is that CBDC offer the unique characteristic of central bank money, safe, natural, and final. The emergence of Libra uh, as a global stable coin has indeed accelerated research conducted by central banks. Several central banks have sped up, like I said before, into a piloting phase. So, uh, but the reason for using CBDC is uh, actually vary depending on the needs of each country. In developed country, there are three highest reasons: safety, financial stability, and efficiency. Meanwhile, in emerging country, uh, domestic efficiency, financial inclusion, and financial stability. So, uh, it depends on the on the issue. And now, let's move to my. Last slides in the first part. Uh, so central bank here play a pivotal role in maintaining safe and integrity of payment system. They provide solid foundation by acting as guardian of stability of money and payments. So the combination of traditional view, traditional and new market failures calls for central bank policies. And here we can see that three repositioning the role of central bank as operator, uh, uh, we provide uh, public infrastructure, uh, central bank direct provision and operation of public infrastructure can promote competition, reduce rents, and support high standards and safety and risk management. And uh, as catalysts, uh, we are promoting interoperability. Interoperability is technical and regulatory compatibility that enables one system to work seamlessly with others. It can help level of competitive playing field further enhance efficiency and support entry and innovation. And number three as overseer, guiding and regulating. Historians show that legislation and regulation can promote innovation by altering incentive for the private sector influencing market structure. So central bank have often played in role advising on writing or implementing such rules. That said, that lesson from other network industry indicate that market dominance it's not easily remedied and requires continuous policy intervention. Digital platform raise challenge actually for traditional antitrust or market power analysis. Today, the price of structure of platform does not confirm the textbook model of monopoly pricing. Likewise, even where price of retail customer are declining, lack of competition may be slowing innovation. Thus, uh, we as central bank, uh, we need to reassess regulatory approach by looking across platform globally, enhancing cooperation among central bank and other authorities. That's all my part in the first uh, part. Uh, let Pak Bedur uh, move to the next part. Thank you, Pak Agung. Um, um, previously, Pak Agung has already explained a lot about global phenomenon and how regulator um, Change their approach in and in, in, um, regulating the, the digital economic and finance. I, I will try to focus on how Indonesian digital economic updates and how um, uh, we can respond. Bank Indonesia's regulatory response uh, to this uh, to those phenomena. Now, the first slide I'm talking about how Indonesia is basically has a strong digital foundation. You can see that um, Indonesia has a very good uh, demographic structure, dominated by millennials, and 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 we have a lot also a high internet penetration. You can see on the left hand side that, that our demographic structure is dominated by millennials, uh, Gen Y and Gen Z, which is 59%. Uh, and this allows digital technology in Indonesia to be adopted very quickly. Now, also, moreover, until quarter one in 2021, Indonesia has become the largest, the fourth largest internet users in the world, with a total of 171 uh, million people, or no, 175 million new people or 64% uh, of the total population. Now, this massive digitalization in Indonesia is also supported by increasingly affordable access to technology, thus enabling uh, increased public participation that has not been covered by uh, conventional services. Now, aside from the demographic structure, we see that 
um, during the pandemic, especially digital transformation and the growth of digital transaction has uh, rapidly accelerated. Uh, now we see that this is in line with our initiative, Indonesian Payment System Blueprint, which was previously launched in 2019. And we say that the development of digital economic and financial ecosystem has continued. Now, this digital economic and financial transactions um, uh, continue reflected uh, through at least four uh, indicators. We can see in this uh, graphic, digital banking, e-commerce, electronic money, and also um, QR Indonesian standard. In digital banking, we um, see that it keep growing even in the first uh, semester of 2021. We experienced uh, the, the growth of 39% year on year. On the e-commerce side, it's even more phenomenal. The number that we see, uh, we increase 63% uh, transaction in e-commerce year on year. On um, electronic money also by 41% and more, uh, more phenomenal. In QR Indonesian standards, since its launch, it's already been uh, growth by 214% uh, year on year, the transaction. Now, aside from the, uh, the demographic structure, the uh, adoption, and also the transaction that, that keep growing, from the industry perspective, we see that the number of fintechs also keep accelerating. In the last four years, uh, 2016 to 2020, there has been a very significant increase in the number of fintech players. We see that an average um, of 110% um, growth per year um, in, the, in the number of uh, fintech players not only in the number of fintech players. Now in 2016 and 2017, the fintech business model was generally only payment system and P2P lending. Now uh, the business model is, is um, rapidly growing. Now we can see at least there are uh, 83 type of digital financial innovation, which classified into 16 clusters. Clusters In the right-hand side, we see it ranges from aggregator, financial planner, credit scoring, insurance tech, rec tech, and so on and so forth. And we see that this is a good indicator how innovation keep growing in the financial sector, especially in, in Indonesia. Now, not only from the financial sector, other type of business we see also keep innovate, especially, in the, especially during the pandemic era, they keep doing a pivoting strategy in their business and the containment measures during the pandemic, um, PPKM trigger more innovation from the business or what we call as home economy which prompted the creation of various new business models uh, on the supply side. You can see banking from home is the new banking. There are also taxi delivery, grocery, fuel on delivery, and supermarket booking have become the uh, mainstream solutions for economic activities without having to ignore the COVID-19 health protocol. Um, and for this reason, at the, same, at, the, at the same time, we see that payment system is um, present as the catalyst through digitizing payments and offline to online payment. Now, Pak Agung has also mentioned that basically in today's digital era, the boundaries between industry is becoming increasingly blurred, um, uh, increasingly blurred, and uh, the competitive landscape has changed not only within the industry, but also across industry, particularly with technology company. In the financial sector, for example, the role of non-bank ranging from um, startup to big tech is increasing. And uh, recently, we see that the trend of collaboration between bank and fintech has been getting stronger, especially through the open APIs uh, mechanism. Uh, in this context, uh, banking and fintech we see requires a competition mindset, which is a collaboration and competition to improve their quality of services. And we see that the new normal era shows that the competition is no longer to be responded directly. Collaboration is a new keyword to be able to maximize the benefits of digitalization for all parties to ensuring healthy competition among actors. Now we see why this uh, uh, collaboration is becoming um, the new mainstream. Because the main driver of, of, of partnership because both parties think that uh, which each, each actors bring essential assets to the deal. FinTech are tech driven, banks are usually risk offers, but somehow they, uh, they have their own benefit. And if they collaborate one to another, they will give um, a better solution. Now on the right hand side, we can also at least five value proposition, proposition of this, um, of this uh, collaboration, the digital and mobile based product. They will back by strong capital, millennials as the main segment. And also we see that um, open API that are, has already been standardized is authorized by Bank Indonesia. Now, aside from that, we see also digitalization also bring opportunities to increase inclusivity, not only financial inclusive inclusion, but also even economic inclusion. 
Now, aside from the uh, the, the fact before, uh, as I already been explained before, Indonesia is still also have a high number of unbanked people, around 45% in 2017. In also, Indonesia also have a lot of SMEs, and that is the big potential for business to improve or to you know to um, onboard them to digital ecosystem, either by being either by bank or by fintech. And we see by the inclusion of SMEs to digital ecosystem, um, they are expected to have a better recorded transaction um, at least, and which in the end hopefully increase their access to formal financial institution either uh, lending or transaction services. Government also um, have several initiatives to increase digital use of um, ecosystem through three main initiatives, such as electronification of government transaction, um, social assistance, and also uh, transportation. Uh, we, op we are optimistic that digitalization will help boost inclusion, financial and economic, and the expansion of inclusivity is already uh, there. You can see on the right-hand side, uh, the extensive network be built by several uh, uh, big tech, um, Gojek, Bukalapak, or even Tokopedia. Now, however, if also it continues to grow, um, um, also it continues to grow, the acceleration of digital economic and finance is not without challenge. There are still several structural challenges that still need attention. The gap between regions, for example, especially in the provision of infrastructure, competitiveness of human resources, and financial literacy is certainly um, you know, um, uh, joint homework from all regulators and also the industry. In addition, the center of economic activity also is still very um, concentrated in the island of Java, especially in DKI Jakarta. Also, cause the distribution of digital transaction still uneven now. Therefore, we think that digitalization needs to be navigated through a comprehensive and structural policy approach that so digital transformation is able to integrate the, particip the participation of all economic actors both large and small, uh, from inside Java or outside the Java into an inclusive and sustainable digital ecosystem. Now, this slide also show another data supported that Indonesia still have structural challenge, especially in three main area, digital talent, technology, and also future readiness. And therefore, we think we really appreciate this kind of initiatives or program held by um, academia like uh, uh, university uh, like UNS to improve the skill set of the uh, student and on the digital area. Now, considering all of the factor, the condition and the fact I've mentioned before, we think that the outlook for the digital economic and finance in 2021 is expected to remain positive until the end of uh, the year. We believe in our optimism, at least after seeing four facts of digitalization. First, the transformation of e-commerce, uh, product and services. Second, the collaboration between uh, players. Uh, bank and fintech. The third is the expansion of ecosystem through corporate action. Uh, we already see, you know, some of corporate action that have witnessed together, like uh, Gojek with Tokopedia merger, Grab, Amtech um, across investment, and the, the recent uh, IPO of Bukalapak shows that basically digital is keep growing. Um, the trust of uh, people is there, and this is a good momentum uh, to be uh, supported. And for the, and the last, we see that banking digitalization keep uh, growing, especially with open API, both to old players and also new players with fair strategy, model ranging from strengthening internal capacity and also expanding ecosystem. Now, considering all of the factors, now the question would be, as an authority, how to strike the balance between harnessing digital opportunity and mitigating the risk? Bank Indonesia as the Central Bank of Indonesia, of course, does not remain silent. We realize that authorities must be able to strike the balance uh, between efforts to increase the development of innovation and efforts to mitigate the risk. And we understand that reforms are needed both in terms of how we view a business and how to regulate it and how to monitor and also supervise the development of digital economy and finance. Based on that understanding, we already um, formulated our vision. There are five visions. Um, uh, and, and this vision present the direction of payment system policy at Bank Indonesia in order to navigate the payment system industry in the era of the digital economic and finance. Now, this blueprint contains five uh, vision. Um, the first one is uh, supporting the integration of national digital economic and finance. The second one is supporting the digital transformation of banking industry. The third one is uh, ensuring interlinks between bank and fintechs. The fourth one is um, ensuring balancing innovation um, and consumer protection, integrity and stability, as well as 
fair competition in the last of all, which is very important, ensuring the national interest on cross-border use of digital economic and finance. And these five visions is the final target or the end state of Bank Indonesia's long-term policy direction. Now, these five visions um, outline into five main policies and initiatives to encourage innovative and adaptive industry to technological development and the needs of society. Basically, there are three policy aspects addressed in, in, in the blueprint. The first one is restructuring the payment system industry in the digital era. Second, ensuring interoperable and interconnected payment infrastructure. And the last of all, uh, we see the payment data as a public goods. The implementation of these five vision uh, outlined in five main initiatives. The first one is um, developing open banking to open API standard. The second one is strengthening the configuration, the configuration of retail payment system. There are three uh, main deliverable. The first one is uh, Bank, Bank Indonesia Fast, fast Payment, 24-7 um, retail payment infrastructure. Also, um, uh, three QR Indonesian standard that has already been um, implemented since the early of uh, 2020. The third one is uh, on the whole cell payment system and FMI. Uh, this initiative will be achieved through modernization infrastructure and strengthening the regulatory framework for financial uh, market infrastructure. The fourth one, uh, developing public infrastructure for data. This initiative will be implemented through the provision of public infrastructure for data management. Data openness and transparency and market discipline are expected to be accomplished through this initiative. And the last initiative is regulatory reform. This initiative will be achieved through strengthening the framework of payment system, regulatory and supervisory framework, as well as promoting an integrated licensing regime. Now, through this step, um, the rapid pace of digitalization hopefully could be accommodated by um, uh, regulation, entry policy, and supervisory action with supervisory action with which support the needs of digital era, uh, encourage innovation, and mitigate risk adequately. Now, how far um, the Indonesian payment system blueprint up, up until 2021, at least we're going to have three key milestones that need to be achieved this year. The first one is uh, open API standard that has been already rolling out in the um, August 17th, uh, exactly the same as the Independence Day of Indonesia. Uh, this open API standard expected to be able to promote at least three things, promote interconnection, interoperability and compatibility, encouraging bank and fintech interlinks, and also encouraging level of playing field, including prevent the risk of shadow banking. Now, second in the retail payment infrastructure area, uh, we, we hopefully we can uh, roll out the implementation of BFAS, uh, the first phase uh, for credit transfer feature. Hopefully, hopefully it could be uh, launched in the end of this year. Even though the pandemic situation continues, we are still optimistic that it could be still implemented. And also at the CRIS, we'll, uh, CRIS uh, CPM will be launched soon. And also we already launched the piloting of CRIS cross-border with uh, Thailand. Uh, this month, uh, together with the launching of Open API Standard. Uh, moreover, uh, next year, uh, at the uh, next few years, we're going to also expand this cross-border uh, to other uh, countries, uh, to other um, you know, um, um, partner countries of Indonesia. In terms of regulatory reform, we already uh, launched the umbrella regulation for payment system in last year. We already uh, uh, launched or published the regulation for payment system, uh, service providers and payment infrastructure operators in the first July, and we are we already uh, published the regulation for payment system national standard. Now, these three key milestone is important as the next step after we um, after we launch the initiative of Chris in uh, early 2020. Now, I'm going to specifically talk about Chris as the game changer of uh, the retail payment system, especially in the digital era. Now, one of the main deliverable of uh, our blueprint that has been running since 2020 is the QR code Indonesian standard. This QR code um, feature also continues to be developed. The first is uh, the merchant presented mode. You may see that are a lot of uh, you know um, uh, merchant um, either it's an SMEs or in the mall uh, sticker with QR and QR Indonesian standard is there. It can accept uh, many uh, you know many source of fund you know, from bank and fintech just through one um, QR standard. Now, in the future, we're going to develop into Chris CPM. Now, uh, uh, the, the Chris CPM is um, customer presented mode, which is your phone uh, generating QR and the merchant scan your QR. 
one of the examples maybe if you go to the uh, some of the merchant like uh, McDonald's or KFC for example has already been implemented this uh, kind of features. Now also we're going to also implement Chris on delivery, um, um, Chris um, transfer withdraw and deposit, and also expanding Chris cross border after piloting with uh, Bank of Thailand. Now, Chris has already been, you know, since the launch on August 17, 2019, and it's fully implemented in starting January 1st on 2020. And after 20 months since it launched the, to date, Chris has been adopted by more than 87 million merchants, of which 94% 94 94 are merchants in micro, small, and medium enterprise sectors, MSME. And the use of Chris, Chris payment method is also increasingly widespread. As you can see from the transaction volume that, that continues to increase every month. Now, last year, this Chris initiative also received an award from Central Banking, Swintech, and uh, Rectech Global Award as the best payment system innovation of the year. Lastly, uh, but not least, we believe that digitalization will be able to transform Indonesia into a high income developed country, digital transformation in, in financial sector, carried out generally by regulators and the industry will be able to answer uh, the challenge in the new normal era and provide greater benefits for all Indonesian peoples, especially opening up access for 83.1 million unbanked people and 62.9 million MSMEs to formal economics and finance through sustainable method uh, and sustainable manner through digitalization. I think that's all for me. Uh, get back to you, Pak Agung. Okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Mr. Agung Purwoko and Mr. Abdurrahman. Uh, now we move to Q&A session. Uh, now uh, we have uh, some lots of questions from participants. And let me... Uh, the first is from Farhan from UNS. Uh, how do we make decentralized uh, economy with asset backed currency uh, decentralized CBDC? Maybe uh, Mr. Agung or Mr. Abdul can answer it now. Sorry, can you repeat the question um, a little bit? How to understand that? Oh, I'm sorry. I will uh, I will replay. Uh, okay. How do we make a decentralized economy with asset backed currency decentralized CBDC? Pago, will you answer or, or uh, let me answer? <laughs> yeah. Mister or Mister Abdul. Okay. Uh, sorry. Uh, may, may, uh, okay. Maybe uh, Pak Bedur can uh, complete my my response on that issue. Maybe how uh, how the use CBDC can uh, facilitate the can decentralize CBDC. Uh, now, uh, maybe we we, we should uh, make it clear that uh, CBDC actually is now decentralized or it's uh, it's different with. Uh, CBDC is not only maybe it's a blockchain issue or 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 just like making stable coins without uh, with that third party with with without a uh, center on the on the ecosystem. Uh, uh, if we talk about CBDC, is how a central bank deal with uh, deal with the issue. The there are need of uh, money, digital money as. The same uh, the same level of uh, service like other other money like uh, now, <clears throat> so uh, how central bank deliver that CBDC? Of course, it uh, come from the uh, way, uh, which uh, use case that we uh, choose. So, what is the most pain uh, pain uh, like pain point? On, on the use of digital money in, in the digital economy. So uh, that's the, 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 that's the first points. So uh, when, when we talk about technology, so when, when we talk about technology, it, it comes after, after we decide uh, the motivation, like the motivation of using CBDC and the, let's say the, um, 
said that the what the consumer needs cash like convenient real time payment resilient or robust operation and and the and the left side of the cbdc pyramid as you know that and on the left side of cbdc pyramid uh, when we when we design the DCP, cbdc choice we should consider uh, do 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 the consumer need the cash like uh, which uh, operate not only in online situation but on also in offline situation uh, what if uh, if our phone may be in low bed how can cbdc can still facilitate the transaction uh, so uh, that's why we should consider how cbdc operate in in low bed uh, environment and also if uh, do uh, do cbdc also facilitate cross border payment do we need uh, digital rupiah let's say operate in other jurisdiction uh, do we need that so uh, do uh, and after we we consider the issue that's uh, after that we use we 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 design we choice the cbdc design and so uh, so after 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 we choose what is the biggest pay our our needs that's now uh, to the design of technology uh, uh, so this is uh, maybe my my uh, views on that. Maybe Pak Bedur, you can uh, add with the technology views. Yeah, thank you, Pak uh, Well, basically, if you see on the left hand side uh, uh, map, basically most countries are actually um, still on the pro on, on the face of um, you know and doing research. Or um, or on, on retail research on and basically there's there are no yet consensus between countries on which best design CBDC they will use. Just Pak Agung uh, I've already mentioned before it depends on the on the you know on the motivation on why we going to develop CBDC as well as uh, other countries Indonesia is also still on the still on the phase of retail research where we are um, weighing um, cost and benefit analysis between those CBDC design choice are going. Are we going to use a DLT base or conventional central bank infrastructure, just like uh, right now, or are we going to use account or token base, for example? It depends on, you know, it depends on the uh, on the needs of the uh, on the consumer. And at the and at the uh, current time, the phase of um, almost all countries is basically still on the research, and the uh, and the countries that are, had already been implemented maybe. Uh, one of the most success um, uh, success case maybe in, in, in the in the Tiongkok and the Chinese well on how they also not just also you know, rely on one design but also on multiple design for example they use CBDs on their smartphone they also have uh, their um, CBDs on their card base so they so this so that CBDC can be function as well as you know paper currency they they, they are not really they're not Dependent only from the um, you know internet uh, access, for example. I think maybe uh, that's the answer for for me, Pak Agung and Mas Ferry. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, thank you, Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdurrahman. And now we move to the second question. Uh, there is a lot of question uh, in this session, but we will uh, pick uh, four question to answer it. And now the second question is from V3. From UPM, uh, Mr. Uh, to Mr. Agung, what is the pro probability of blockchain implementation in financial regulation sector? Is it possible to use the technology to enhance the quality of the financial sector compliance? Mr. Agung, time is yours. Okay. Uh, in my presentation before, I, I mentioned that blockchain is one of part the innovative technology that sometimes that use uh, use in the financial and actually uh, also in especially in payments uh, as uh, uh, one of areas is uh, is payments and with the blockchain banking leverage benefits such high level security while transferring money quick safe transfer operating in real time ability to serve around the clock and visible and faster cross-border payment 
and uh, uh, moreover also uh, the adoption of blockchain in KYC is also uh, benefited the typical onboarding process of customers is actually uh, usually quite expensive and consumes a lot of times KYC includes a lot of verification right from financial background to other personal data with the blockchain customer database are automatically updated with relevant information and facilitate sharing between loans officer and banks in secure manner now uh, some banks in fintechs also explore uh, the possibility use of blockchains and 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 maybe it, and actually this is different between uh, blockchain and blockchain and the alt and bitcoin is different that now as a technology uh, blockchain is now uh, getting popular in in the financial industry thank you yes uh, thank you for the answer and now we move to the third question is from faki from undip based on the information of the massive and high increase in use of digital payment will that even be possible if somehow in the future the use of paper based or metal based money become decreased or even fully disappeared and replaced by all digital payment and also what is the pros and cons about the massive uh, use on digital payment uh, mr agung and mr uh, abdur uh, time is yours silakan pak abdur ya yeah, thank you pak agung uh, basically um, it depend on, on 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 what countries you're in for example in in, in china Um, you, you may be see that paper currency is um, almost extinct. <laughs> you know, even even the even the uh, the I don't know what they call it, pengamen on on the street side, street side musician even accept money with QR code. Even the you know small merchants selling uh, fruit, they are not accepting um, paper currency. They're they're accepting through QR code payment. And if you bring paper currency in China, um, most probably you are. Um, new citizens or maybe your foreigners, <laughs> but in Indonesia maybe that that's not the case. That's not yet the case for now. But um, we, but yeah, for now that's not yet the case. Uh, the data shows that basically even though digital payment is keep increasing, the needs for paper currency is also still high. Even though the growth is um, decelerating, it shows that basically you know um, uh, somehow. Maybe in the in the uh, in the time of pandemic, also some people need uh, paper currency as as you know as, as backup, uh, just in case their you know their local merchants in in their neighbor our neighborhood area still not yet accepting cashless payment, for example, and so on and so forth. Therefore, you know um, you know cash still still there. Number two, um, outside you know outside Java, as I've mentioned before, there are still a digital divide. Between Java and outside Java, especially in terms of infrastructure, internet access, and so on and so forth. And in those area, Bank Indonesia will have to make sure that um, that rupiah is 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 there, is there, even though the infrastructure is not there yet. But in the future, also, uh, but in the future, it's clear that we're we're heading through that direction. We're going to uh, maximize and also um, optimize. The use of cashless uh, transaction and also uh, minimize the use of uh, paper currency, uh, but when it will extinct, uh, we still don't know yet. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Abdul uh, and Ms. Agung. Uh, you want to answer it or just move to the next question? Uh, I I will add the uh, one of the question uh, do the the cash will be fully disappeared uh, if we if you travel in Japan actually now Japan is the most uh, the high tech countries but the most of people still use cash why why because uh, it, uh, All the cash also part of the culture, part of the culture, and and switch to the condition, uh, slice risk of uh, earthquake. So the if so the digital payment may still not support the 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 that situation. 
the situation. So uh, uh, let's uh, back to the back to the value. What is the value proposed by the 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 form of money? Cash, no cash, digital. So it's came came to the the nature, the nature of your country, the nature of uh, so. Uh, the money is not only about economic function; it's also, but it's also a social function. Uh, is identity of the countries. Yes. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Agung, for your answer. And now we move to the last question uh, from Anarga from U uh, UGM. Uh, how you ensure the security from every transaction made? Uh, do you have any regulation that implements? Effectively, because data surveillance issue is not just small talk. Is it? Uh, it is critical things that can make everyone who use this technology feel safe. And of course, is government government uh, responsibility to take the first step in. Thank you. Okay, I will. I will first uh, answer this question. Thank you, Anarga. Uh, how how we we ensure that the transaction is secure? Uh, that's why we we set the the regulation, and we set the regulation, uh, set the regulatory perimeters. Who should uh, who can uh, who 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 is the player can meet the standards? That's why in our regulation we issue the Peraturan Bank Indonesia. Payment system, uh, Peraturan Bank Indonesia for payment system provider, uh, payment system infrastructure provider, uh, they should comply with our standard, our standard in in management, our standard in technology, our standard in security, and and that should comply with this regulation. They also we also have a supervision team. Uh, supervision team which regularly supervise the the transaction and make sure that all the, all of the infrastructure uh, meet the meet our standards that's how uh, that's how and and uh, uh, we have a sanction of uh, if the if the payment system provider uh, uh, not comply with our regulation so, so that's that's our that's our role in how to ensure the security in every transaction made. That's why the payment system provider should should have the uh, should uh, comply to to the standards. Like um, in payment system, we have PCI DSS standards. Uh, so, and if and if there are some uh, maybe activity, uh, the, our our supervisors can come to the to the to the payment system provider infrastructure and uh, supervise what's going on on that issue. Okay, Pabedur, maybe you can add uh, the information. Yeah, thank you, Pago. Um, just. As already mentioned by Pago, basically every payment system provider in Indonesia have to be has has to be through licensing regime or licensing procedures in, in Bank Indonesia. The, and this licensing requirement is um, set by Bank Indonesia to make sure that uh, they have adequate um, infrastructure, adequate um, cyber security uh, system, and so on and so forth. After they are becoming payment system pro uh, provider. They're, they're, they're going to be supervised regularly. And beside that, we also have a um, you know, set of uh, regulation. Um, besides our payment system um, regulation, we, already, we, also, we also just released um, um, Bank Indonesia regulation on consumer protection. On, that, and on those regulations, we touch a lot about how uh, data protection becoming an important matter for, for the consumer. Because as we know that in this digital era, data is the new oil. And if data is not managed uh, well or data is not managed properly by this payment system provider, they're going to lose trust from the consumer and the consumer could easily uh, change or shift it to other uh, payment system provider. And if they are, um, you know, does not manage this data properly, this payment system provider also face the risk of sanction from Bank of Indonesia or even worse, 
if um, you know if if they are doing a hard or heavy um, heavy you know uh, heavy wrong practices they could even uh, bank indonesia could even take uh, away their license i think maybe that's all thank you Okay, thank you, uh, Mr. Abdurrahman and Mr. Agung for your uh, answer. And now uh, I will remind their participants, uh, don't forget to fill the attendance list and because the attendance list now I favor to open it. And now uh, I think there is some que good question. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdurrahman. It's from Farhan. Uh, I'm sorry, my question is a little bit off. Uh, this is the correct one from Farhan Wenes. Uh, the correct uh, question is uh, how do we detect suspicious activities such, such as money laundering, money laundry, the drug trafficking, etc. Uh, that is done using privacy coins such as Monero, where the transaction history is being delayed cashlessly. Maybe, maybe uh, Mr. Agung or Mr. Abdurrahman can answer it. Okay, sorry. Uh, how we detect fraudulent uh, activities by uh, crypto asset? Do Monero is a crypto asset or or what? Uh, uh, can you explain more regarding this? Sorry, privacy coin. Uh, maybe we can talk to Farhan for uh, last question. Maybe. Oh. The answer yes, yes. Monero is uh, active coin. Okay, uh, okay. Uh, so this is actually uh, why we still actually in terms of in terms of payment, uh, we pre we prohibited the use of uh, the use of uh, like uh, private uh, digital currency use in Indonesia. So uh, we, we cannot uh, uh, the virtual asset is is uh, is not uh, not part of our regulation and we still uh, prohibited the use of uh, virtual currency. Uh, that's why uh, in, in in these issues uh, we we. Uh, Closely coordination. Uh, we have closely coordination with uh, PPATK here in in track and and deal with this issue. But uh, the the regulator of the virtual now now virtual asset is uh, Monero. Maybe it's part of virtual asset is now under the uh, in Kemendak. Yeah, maybe maybe Pak Bedur can add this issue. Yeah, thank you, Pak Agung. Well, basically, um, um, on on the money laundering on on um, terrorism financing, there are also national um, task force. Um, Indonesia Bank of Indonesia becoming not the member, Bapepti also becoming one of the member, and all the member of this uh, national task force is committed to follow the standard of um, you know uh, money laundering and also counter financing terrorism. And, and on all regulators, um, uh, you know, um, becoming member member of this national task force also um, need to be comply to the FATF uh, standard. This is the international standard on on money laundering and also counter financing terrorism. Um, so on, the, on this um, case, um, on this virtual um, asset, as Pak Agung mentioned before, it's it's not under the area of payment because Bank Indonesia is explicitly um, prohibit. The use of virtual asset as a payment um, uh, means, but uh, it is legal as an as an you know as an uh, digital asset by but under the regulation of property. So this uh, property all so this this, this will be uh, you know under the monitoring of property to make sure that all of the uh, all of the players on on this um, virtual asset are comply to their standard, which is also. Um, um, Based on the international standard on on the FATF, maybe uh, that's the answer. Thank you. Okay, thank you for Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdul for your uh, answer. And now we, uh, I'm sorry, uh, is from from UNS. 
uh, Deutsche Bank Indonesia cooperate with the Commodity Future Trading Regulatory Agency or BPT in the protection and supervision of investor who experience loss caused by customer selling their asset in trading crypto asset on the future exchange. Maybe Mr. Agum or Mr. Abdurrahman can answer it. No, actually. <laughs> No, we don't have any cooperation with uh, BAPAPTI because it's, it is under uh, their, uh, their areas, uh, uh, the area of BAPAPTI. Okay, uh, thank you. I think it's enough. Uh, okay, uh, dear participant, uh, to all the students, this is the end of this session. Uh, our gratitude is addressed to Mr. Agung Purwoko and Mr. Abdurrahman. Uh, before we end this, uh, Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdurrahman, would you give your closing statement before we sign off on this screen? Start with Pak Bedur, maybe? Closing statement uh, from Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdurrahman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Pak Agung. Um, maybe, you know, um, as, as we already mentioned before, the digital talent becoming one of the shortage of Indonesia in, you know, in absorbing the benefit of digital economy in the future. We believe that uh, um, that this um, you know this youth, especially you guys, will not be the shortage. And I think this kind of initiative should be continued uh, to tackle the problem of um, you know the lack of digital talent. And you have to learn more on it because Indonesia is a big uh, country. And if you know how to you know how to you know how you know you know how the best approach uh, to absorb the benefit of digitalization. Then Indonesia will become um, um, an advanced country in the future, hopefully. Pak Agung. Okay. Uh, in my experience, uh, since I joined the, these issues, Indonesia is becoming uh, the most important countries after China, actually. Uh, Indonesia is part of uh, not only a consumer, actually, and, but also. Uh, become one of center, uh, one of center of uh, innovation. So uh, as Abdur said, uh, let's come to the ecosystem, build the healthy and innovative ecosystem, not only for Indonesia, but also for the world. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdurrahman for the closing statement. Before and we end the class, uh, can we take a picture for this class session? Maybe. Sure, sure. And their participant, uh, can uh, all of you to turn on your camera to uh, take a screenshot for this session? Okay, I will count uh, in three, uh, two screenshots, uh, and one, two, and three, and now the next uh, slide. In one, two, three, and once again, uh, one, two, three. Okay. Okay, thank you uh, once again. Thank you for your for joining with us and also share your insightful by based on your experience and expertise, Mr. Agung and Mr. Abdul Rahman. Hope you have a good day. Uh, okay, thank you. And now, uh, dear participant, uh, for the next month, uh, we will discuss about peer-to-peer -peer lending that will be presented by Mr. Sunu Widyat Moko from ASPI at uh, 12 half p.m. Uh, today. I suggest uh, to you to keep being online. You can just turn off your video and be ready uh, be ready again uh, in 10 minutes before the next move started. I'm Ferry Susanto, sign off from this room and see you on the next session. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Terima kasih, Mas Ferry. Good leave. Terima kasih, teman-teman semua. Thank you, Mr. Agung, Mr. Abdurrahman. Ya, terima kasih. Uh, terima kasih, terima kasih Mas Udur. Ya, sama-sama, Agung. Jadi,